Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers crime scenes, detentions, and obstruction, and is brought to us by investigative journalist Tony Biasati from the Ventura County Star. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On October 9th, 2020, retired firefighter Joseph Garces was driving his Jeep in Santa Paula, California, when he saw shooting victim Samir Salgado lying face up in a parking lot in a pool of liquid. Mr. Garces pulled over next to the man, and when he realized the liquid was blood, he got out of his vehicle and began to administer CPR. Shortly thereafter, several officers with the Santa Paula Police Department arrived on the scene, and the interaction that followed was captured on their body cameras. Don't go to that car. Don't go to that car. Stay over here. Stay over here. Stay over here. Stay over here. Come over here. That's your car? That's my car. I was driving by. I saw it. I'm a retired fire. Okay. I'm not a part of this. We don't know anything about that. We see a gun in the car. You're not going there. Do you have your ID? It's in the car. What's your name? Joe Garces. Joe Garces. You got, you got to relax, okay? We know you're helping us out. Wait, but you guys aren't listening either. That's part of the problem. Yeah. So I said we appreciate your being involved, I, I it, okay? We just run it. That's his knife. I took it out of his pocket to cut his shirt okay. off. And that's your vehicle. Yeah, I was driving north. I saw the lady. They were looking this way, and I saw him down, and I thought it was beer or something. Spun around and came in, saw the blood. She said they were calling 911. I screamed, has he been shot? She said, yeah, it was. I was pulling in. Okay. Saw the gunshot wound to the side of his face. Um, I did a quick check. Found the gun in his waistband, rendered it useless, stuck it inside my car. Grabbed his knife, cut off his shirt, and then you guys started showing up. Okay. Did you, see, started any, doing CPR. Did you see anybody no, running, nothing, anybody nothing, leaving nothing. the area, nothing. anything? Would not you a thing. Leave him? Someone when he leaves him, get a mask. Not on. a thing. Sir, get this guy out of here. Oh, Sir. He's, he's, he's a witness. Jesus. What the f? Relax, relax. Okay. Please start. Uh, we appreciate it. Huh? So I got a crime scene, sir. I'm a detective. Yeah, and I'm here helping him, so step the f off. Out of my okay? Car. If you're a good detective, you wouldn't be yelling at me right now. You'd be taking care of your f job. Over here. Yeah, f you. I can't get the f. Get out of my crime scene! Come with me, Mr. Gar Garces. Mr. Garces. Come with me, Mr. Garces. Detective Chris Rivera arrives and orders Mr. Garces to get out of his crime scene, and the other officers lead Mr. Garces outside the perimeter of the scene. Officers generally have the authority to close a crime scene to the public, and, as the Supreme Court noted in the 1972 case of Brandsburg versus Hayes, even the press has, quote, no constitutional right of access to the scenes of crime or disaster when the general public is excluded. According to the U.S. Department of Justice publication Crime Scene investigation, a guide for law enforcement, one of the first tasks an initial responding officer should undertake upon arriving at a crime scene is to secure and control persons at the scene. The guide explains that, quote, controlling, identifying, and removing persons at the crime scene and limiting the number of persons who enter the crime scene and the movement of such persons is an important function of the initial responding officers in protecting the crime scene, and states that the initial responding officers should, quote, control all individuals at the scene and prevent individuals from altering or destroying physical evidence by, quote, restricting movement, location, and activity while ensuring and maintaining safety at the scene. Additionally, first responding officers should identify all individuals at the scene, secure and separate suspects and witnesses, and remove bystanders from the scene. Here, because Mr. Garces was a witness who was being interviewed, it seems more appropriate under the DOJ's guidelines that he would be secured and separated without necessarily being removed move from the scene like a bystander would be. However, given the broad discretion that officers have to protect and secure crime scenes, a court would likely conclude that Detective Rivera had the authority to remove Mr. Garces from the perimeter. Yeah. No wonder people don't give you guys the benefit of the doubt. And I work with you for 27 years. When do I get my car back then? Hey, tell them Thank you for teaching me not to be helpful, you fat piece of You have to stay back. Step back, step back, step back, step back, step back. I don't know who you're fucking Oh, yeah, so now you're going to come over with me, huh? You're doing a really good job right now, aren't you? I need you to back up. You need to calm him. I need you to back up. Come here. No, I got him. I got him. I got him. Come here. No, you need to hands off me. Really, the pain compliance, that's what we need to do. 
What's his name? After Mr. Garces shouts at Detective Rivera from outside the parking lot, Detective Rivera leaves the scene, approaches Mr. Garces, and puts his hand on his shoulder. Mr. Garces pulls his arm away and uses a profanity to tell Detective Rivera to keep his hands off him. In response, Officer Rivera immediately grabs Mr. Garces's right arm, wrenches it behind his back, and C-clamps his forearm and elbow. As we have discussed before on ATA, in order for an officer's use of force against a citizen to be constitutional, it must be quote-unquote reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees citizens the right, quote, to be secure in their persons against unreasonable seizures. In the 1989 case of Graham versus Connor, the Supreme Court explained that, quote, determining whether the force used to effect a particular seizure is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment requires a careful balancing of the nature and quality of the intrusion on the individual's Fourth Amendment interests against the countervailing governmental interests at stake. And while the court noted that, quote, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence has long recognized that the right to make an arrest or investigation investigatory stop necessarily carries with it the right to use some degree of physical coercion or threat thereof to affect it, it ultimately concluded that the force used to conduct an arrest or investigatory detention must be justified under, quote, the facts and circumstances of each particular case, including the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and whether he is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. We will discuss whether Detective Rivera had reasonable suspicion or probable cause to detain or arrest Mr. Garces later in this episode. But even assuming that Detective Rivera had the authority to seize Mr. Garces, any offense he could be suspected of committing was nonviolent and not particularly serious. And there was no evidence that he posed a danger to anyone's safety, as he was simply involved in a verbal altercation and at no point made any physical threats or moved his body in a threatening way. As for the third factor, whether Mr. Garces was actively resisting arrest, Detective Rivera never informed Mr. Garces that he was being detained or arrested, and never requested that he put his hands behind his back or otherwise comply with other commands. So it would be unfair to characterize him pulling away from Detective Rivera and telling him not to touch him as an attempt to resist an arrest. Applying the three Graham factors to this situation, it is certainly possible that a jury would conclude that Detective Rivera's use of force was unreasonable and excessive under the Fourth Amendment. Likewise, the so-called c clamp grab may have violated the Santa Paula Police Department's use of force policy, which states that, quote, officers shall use only that amount of force that reasonably appears necessary given the facts and totality of the circumstances known to or perceived by the officer at the time of the event to accomplish a legitimate law enforcement purpose. And that, quote, officers may only use a level of force that they reasonably believe is proportional to the seriousness of the suspected offense or the reasonably perceived level of actual or threatened resistance. Because Mr. Garces did not appear to be any sort of physical threat, was not suspected of a serious crime, and was not resisting a stated attempted arrest, he has a strong argument that Detective Rivera's use of force violated his department's use of force policy. What is helping that take it down a notch. You can take, take it, down it down a notch. notch. Somebody here's not take controlling themselves down. into you. Take a deep breath. Don't be a hypocrite. I've taken a deep breath. It's your turn now. Yeah, don't be a hypocrite. You want to talk like adults? I'll let you go. Okay, you want to talk like you an start adult? talking to me like an adult? Do you understand how I need to do, do my job? Do you see what you're doing wrong? Do you, if you know how to do this job and you have a badge, then you would understand. Now, do you want to so go to 148 if you so, have a badge? It's so Do you have you. a badge? Yes, Are you I retired? Do. Yes. Do you want to go for 148 for being in a crime scene? Just because sergeants at patrol don't know how to do their job, and you were a you're cop. You're saying at your one time, sergeant doesn't know how to do his I, job? Take him. Turn him around. Where's your badge at? In my Jeep, like I keep saying, but you won't listen. We're adding your Jeep. And you will see it when you look at the Do you want your car? Do you want me to have to write a search warrant and keep it, or do you want to keep your car? Do you want to get home as soon as possible? I'm not talking anymore. Okay. Sink them, uh, sink them in, uh, six, uh, 64. What's your first name? Joe. Joe. Hey, check that out. I stopped to help somebody been shot. I'm getting arrested. Um, have a seat for a second. Just so you know, I'm retired because of PTSD. Got it. Major anxiety problems. Got it. Being in handcuffs doesn't help me. I know you guys got to do it. Keep away from me. Got it. He is accelerating this way hey, more than I am. I won't let him talk to you anymore. You want the windows down or anything? How can can we, we just it? sit right here with me, the door open? I ain't going anywhere, dude. You guys yeah, all know I'll where sit I right live. Here for now. I mean, I know what you guys do. I mean, I did it with you for right. 27 years in Oxnard, not Santa Paul. Right. To have that happen, that's as unprofessional as anything I did, and a cop shouldn't lose it.
like that. You both, you and I both know that. And do me a favor, yeah. just sit here for now. No problem. Well, they know that. I already told the first couple okay. guys here that there's a gun on the on the uh, pat or the floor of my okay. s of the driver. Okay. Oh, dude, this is gonna freak me out. Come back quick. I'll roll up. I'll roll down the windows. I can't a little stand bit. this. Okay. Man. <laughs> um, and what was your last name, sir? Garces. Garces. G R C E S. Okay. And you're detained right now. Okay. You're yeah, not under arrest. Understand. All right, man. Yeah, I totally get it. The officer informs Mr. Garces that he is being detained and is not under arrest, despite the fact that he has been placed in handcuffs in the backseat of a police vehicle. Although the use of arrest-type detention methods, such as handcuffing an individual or placing them in a police vehicle, does not necessarily transform a reasonable suspicion-based detention into an arrest requiring probable cause, as the Second District Court of Appeal of California explained in the 2008 case of In Ray Antonio B., quote, when the detention exceeds the boundaries of a a permissible investigative stop, the detention becomes a de facto arrest requiring probable cause. The court recognized that handcuffing a suspect did not convert a detention during stops where, quote, the officer had a reasonable basis to believe the detainee presented a physical threat to the officer or would flee, but ultimately concluded that the use of handcuffs in question transformed a detention to an arrest when the officers had no basis to believe that the individual posed a danger to them or that handcuffing him was necessary to affect effectuate the purpose of the stop. Here, it does not seem that the officers conducted any further investigation of Mr. Garces once he was detained. And he would have a valid argument that placing him in a police vehicle in handcuffs constituted an arrest because he was not a physical threat or a flight risk. Still, even if a court determined that Mr. Garces was simply being detained and not arrested, it is unclear whether the officers had the reasonable suspicion to do so constitutionally. Section 148 of the California Penal Code makes it a crime to willfully resist, delay, or obstruct a peace officer, quote, in the discharge or attempt to discharge any duty of his or her employment. Although it could be argued that Mr. Garces delayed Detective Rivera in his investigation of the crime scene, as the 4th District Court of Appeal of California explained in the 1989 case of Long v. Valentino, quote, Speech is generally protected by the First Amendment, even if it is intended to interfere with the performance of an officer's duty, provided no physical interference results. Nonetheless, there is nothing in the statute that limits its application to nonverbal conduct. And in the 1996 case of People v. Robles, the Appellate Division of the Superior Court of California held that an individual could be convicted for obstructing when he warned a suspect of an undercover officer's identity, causing him to run. Likewise, in the 2002 case of in Ray Mohammed C., the 6th District Court of Appeal of California upheld a conviction under the statute when an individual, quote, willfully delayed the officer's performance of duties by refusing the officer's repeated request that he step away from the patrol car because three officers had to order him to step away a total of five times before he complied, and the officers had to interrupt their investigation to deal with him. Still, in reaching this decision, the court noted that the statute does not require individuals to immediately comply with police orders, and that the conviction in this case was warranted because the defendant did not merely fail to respond to an order, but, quote, affirmatively responded to the police orders with defiance. Applying this precedent, it is possible that a court could conclude that Mr. Garces delayed the investigation by arguing with Detective Rivera and not immediately exiting the crime scene when ordered to do so. Or, at the very least, a court could determine that the officers had reasonable suspicion to believe that he had committed this offense. However, given the strong historical recognition recognition by the courts that criticism of the police is protected by the First Amendment, it seems more likely that a court would decide that Mr. Garces was engaged in protected speech, and that because he did comply with the orders to exit the crime scene in a reasonable time frame, he did not violate the obstruction statute. Absolutely. Hey, Cap, can we get some decontamination for a guy in the back of the car here? He was doing CPR, got sure. blood on him. Sure. I, I got the fire captain come over to the camp. Did you guys find the wallet? I don't know. I've been standing over oh, here. Okay. This is the one that needs decontaminated. Cap, he has blood on him. Yeah, he's he's actually a, a witness, but he was doing CPR when we came up, and I got that. We had to. Where's, where's the blood on him? Do you know? I don't know. Oh, okay. It's probably on his hands. So I think afterwards, the other cop said to not worry about it. To uh, I don't know. But. Um, I'm not. I'm, 
I'm good with that. The officers held Mr. Garces in the back of the patrol car for about 15 minutes, after which Detective Rivera uncuffed Mr. Garces and told him he was free to leave. Sometime later, Mr. Garces requested emergency medical services, and a police officer called an ambulance for him. Mr. Garces was treated at Community Memorial Hospital in Ventura, California, and reportedly suffered a dislocated shoulder and torn labrum that had to be surgically repaired. No charges were filed against Mr. Garces. Mr. Salgado survived the shooting, and a suspect was apprehended and charged with attempted murder a few days later. As of the date of writing this episode, the charges are still pending. On August 19th, 2021, Mr. Garces filed a federal lawsuit against Detective Rivera and the city of Santa Paula, alleging civil rights violations, including a federal claim for excessive force and several state law claims. On March 24th, 2023, U.S. District Judge Fernando Anaya Rocha ruled that Detective Rivera had qualified immunity and therefore could not be held personally liable for the federal excessive force claim because the use of a C-clamp hold had not been clearly established as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. However, as of the date of writing this episode, the federal claim is still pending against the city, and the state law claims remain viable against both Detective Rivera and the city. Overall, Detective Rivera gets an F for maintaining an unprofessional and disrespectful demeanor throughout the encounter, unnecessarily employing physical force against Mr. Garces instead of exploring alternative solutions, and potentially arresting Mr. Garces without probable cause. From the moment he arrived on the scene, Detective Rivera expressed unfounded hostility towards Mr. Garces, who, at that time, was simply providing a witness statement to another officer after working to save the life of a shooting victim. And while I understand that he wanted to secure the crime scene, there was no need to speak about and to Mr. Garces in such an insolent tone. Although Mr. Garces responded to Detective Rivera's hostility with inflammatory speech, Detective Rivera also escalated the situation on several occasions and ultimately resorted to a use of force that dislocated Mr. Garces's shoulder. These escalations appeared to be motivated by anger over Mr. Garces's speech rather than legitimate investigatory or safety concerns. And this interaction demonstrates why it is essential for officers to have thick skin when dealing with disrespectful speech from members of the public. As the California legislature noted in Section 835A of the California Penal Code, quote, the authority to use physical force conferred on peace officers is a serious responsibility that shall be exercised judiciously and with respect for human rights and dignity and for the sanctity of every human life. In the future, Detective Rivera would do well to keep the gravity of the authority entrusted to him in mind before resorting to the use of physical force against a member of the public. Mr. Garces gets a B plus because although he shouted profanities at Detective Rivera and did not immediately comply with the officer's commands, he ultimately did clear the crime scene, continued to express his objections to Detective Rivera's lack of professionalism, and took appropriate legal action after being subjected to excessive force. While Mr. Garces certainly was not on his best behavior during this interaction, I understand why he was upset when faced with Detective Rivera's disrespectful conduct and there is a strong argument that his speech was entirely protected by the First Amendment. Additionally, it is possible that Mr. Garces's conduct was affected by his PTSD diagnosis, and as the police officer in this situation, Detective Rivera was the one who should have been responsible for de-escalating the encounter. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Garces for his years of service as a firefighter, and I commend him for both his efforts to save Mr. Salgado's life and to hold Detective Rivera responsible for his actions in court. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.